This is the More to the Story podcast with Dr. Andy Miller. We hope you guys enjoyed today's conversation. Hello, and welcome to the More to the Story podcast with Dr. Andy Miller. I'm so glad you've come along. I'm coming to you from Hollow Rock Camp Meeting in Toronto, Ohio, where I've been preaching for the last several days with Dr. Chris Bounds, a former guest on my podcast. I want you to know that our podcast is sponsored by two groups. One is Wesley Biblical Seminary, where I work. And just in case you didn't know, Wesley Biblical is the most diverse seminary in the country. And we are offering free seminary this fall. But you need to go to wbs.edu and sign up right away because our classes start in less than a month. So check that out. We have great classes in the Wesleyan Holiness tradition, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. Secondly, our second sponsor is WPO Development. And their CEO, my friend, Keith Waters says, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. And Keith and his team, have, he has people all over the country who help people with capital campaigns, feasibility studies, mission planning studies, and they do a great job coming, job coming alongside of you, helping you develop a plan and get where you need to be. So check them out at wpodevelopment.com or you can just Google them. So today on the podcast, I have my friend, Dr. James Pedler from Tyndale Seminary in Canada. And he talks to us about his research into ecclesiology, which has to do with the doctrine of the church. And he has done some significant research on the Salvation Army and some different ideas of churches that function in just different ways. So I think that you'll find this really interesting and helpful. You need to really buckle up and listen closely, but I think there's a lot of insights, particularly for parachurch organizations or groups that function in different ways than normal churches. And I think you'll find it incredibly helpful. God bless you and thanks for checking out More to the Story. Welcome to the More to the Story podcast with Dr. Andy Miller here coming to you from Tampa, Florida, where I currently am. And I'm delighted to have on the show with me today, Dr. James Pedler, who is the um, chair of Wesley Studies and assistant professor of theology at Tyndale Seminary, which is just outside of Toronto in Canada. James, welcome to the podcast. Hi, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Andy. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as we get started, I'll just highlight too that James and I have a little bit different relationship at the moment. At the moment, he's also my teacher of sorts. So on my committee for my own PhD dissertation, James is there. So I hope I am not like, you know, trying to earn points through this, but uh, no, no, we'll yeah. so, James, I just love to hear as we get, before we get into your book, I would love to hear a, just a little bit more of your story and your own journey um, that's led you to be at this place to serve in this capacity at Tyndale. Right. Well, um, I, I grew up in the Salvation Army, so that's part of our connection. And yeah. um, even our families that we were talking before have known each other and things like that, even though we're in different different countries. Right. But, uh, you know, multiple generations, uh, Salvationism behind me and officer grandparents on both sides and all that. And uh, very thankful for my Salvationist heritage and upbringing. Couldn't, couldn't have asked for a better environment to to grow up in. And uh, I, I was on a journey towards ministry, went to uh, university, went to seminary at Wycliffe College in Toronto, which is an Anglican, uh, evangelical yeah. Anglican seminary. And then I did some community services uh, ministry for Salvation Army for a couple of years, and then went back for my for my PhD. And in the meantime, I ended up um, <laughs> discerning that uh, a better fit for me would be in the Free Methodist Church uh, as, in terms of my own personal vocation and officership wasn't really the best fit because I wanted to do more of a specialized teaching and research and combine with pastoring kind of role. So I uh, ended up in the Free Methodist Church uh, partway through my PhD uh, work, but continued to <clears throat> work on the Salvation Army in my academic uh, life, yeah. right? So I continue to study Salvationism as, as part of the Wesleyan tradition and continue to be fascinated by uh, the Salvation Army, especially my interest is in ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. Right. And <clears throat> the Salvation Army is just a really weird ecclesiological animal. Yes. Like it's just, <laughs> it's really fascinating because it's, it's very unique and has some unique features. And so that that was always interest of mine as a as a salvationist, and and struggling of and and all, all salvationists can identify this right. Is the yeah, Salvation yeah. Army a movement or is it right. a church? What is it? What are its distinctives? Those kind of questions were ones that I'd always wrestle with along with others, right? Um, but as I was doing my doctoral work, 
um, I guess I was struggling with what I found was sometimes a um, almost a pride or maybe too much pride in right, Salvationists right, sure. sometimes about how different the Salvation Army was, almost as if right. the Salvation Army was better. Right, right. So I was sure. so I was wrestling with that question of how do we talk about denominational differences in a way that recognizes God's at work and what God is doing in different communities, but isn't divisive and isn't, um, you know, putting down other parts of the body or setting us is setting uh, one group as more uh, church than others or better than others and those sorts of questions. So that was sort of the questions I was wrestling with, which led me into my, my thesis topic. It's interesting. So like there was this clear sense that what you were doing was, um, was, your research even led to a very practical move on your part to move away from uh, the, the Salvation Army as your church home. But even though, do you still consider yourself a Salvationist? Uh, in some ways, sure. I mean, I, I'll never lose that heritage. I, I continue to be very thankful for, for my Salvationist heritage and I continue to shape my life in, in lots of ways. I still have many Salvationist friends. Uh, and so it, it, I don't, I wouldn't, claim that because i don't feel like i can because i'm not officially yeah. a member and i that was be presumptive of me i think yeah sure but but sure there's still a lot of salvationism in me absolutely but there was a period where you were uh, even even seeking to learn in general was it because you were on a track towards officership or were you kind of feeling that out early on yeah i mean i would say i was all the way through seminary and yeah. then and then i delayed um because I knew I wanted to do a PhD and, and, you know, I talked to some officers and they said, well, if you can, maybe better to try and do that first. Cause once you are an officer, it, you know, it's up to your, the leadership, if you are allowed to do a PhD and where you can study and what else you have to do on top of it. So, so I said, well, you know, if it's possible, it might be best to do it beforehand. Yeah. And then in the, and then in the meantime, I sort of discerned, well, for me, it really came down to, um, officership is a, is sort of a jack of all trades kind of um, right, right. approach to ministry. You, you got to be willing to do anything and go anywhere. Right. And that's, that's what it is. And, and I really felt my calling was more just to be a teacher in the church. And that's still how I see my calling. I'm, right. I don't primarily identify as an academic. That's what I do, but it's, it's really serving this, this calling of being a teacher in the church. Right. And, and, and so I, I just felt like, yeah, it was better for me to go somewhere where I could just do that um, constantly rather than right. maybe for a time and then do something else. And, and, and right. so it was, yeah, it was, a, it was, a, it was a quite a journey to discern, uh, you know, cause the salvationism is, runs really deep in me. Right. And, and there's a strong loyalty ethic, right. Absolutely, and, and it's, yeah. and it, it's, it's hard to leave. Right. It was, it was, right. it was hard. So, but uh, anyway, believe me, I understand. Uh, yeah, so sure. like in this moment, I'm in the middle of a transition, um, not mm -hmm. intending to leave the Salvation Army as my church to still maintain mm -hmm. soldiership where we go, but, but I'm stepping outside of officership and some people might say to you, oh, well, well, you could just, you could be at the training school, James, one day you could be a training principal. But I think there is a sense that the, the, the nature of, of serving as, a, I like how you defined it as being a teacher within the church. Like, uh, and, and that's not just teaching, right? Serving as, a, I think, as a scholar within the church means also learning like you mm -hmm. you commit yes. yourself to be a lifelong learner and and scholar in a, in a discipline and for you studying ecclesiology broadly wesleyan theology but then it also expresses itself in the way that you like you teach like that those, mm -hmm. those two things go together and i'm not sure of course there are great there are, are really effective writers who are mm -hmm. who are scholars within the salvation army but that's not something that um has been embraced. I, I mean, I just spent, I'm st at, when we're doing this, I'm still serving as a Salvation Army officer. I had two days ago, just had to spend three hours working through an HR concern, right? And it's very mm -hmm. important, very missional yep. connect. But I would rather spend that time. It, I think the optimization of my gifts might yes. be fulfilled in another way. And I, I feel like that might be similar to what you're saying. Like, I, I want to serve as a teacher within the church. I want to be a scholar. Is that, am I hitting on that the right way? Yes, exactly. And, and yeah, so I, I could frame it too as, how to best steward the gifts God had given me. And it's yeah. not necessarily knock on officership just because that's what officership is. Just came to feel that that's, you know, wasn't the, wasn't the best place uh, 
for me. Although, as I said, yeah, I could, I, I'm sure I would have ended up at the training college or something for part of right, my, right. part of my career. But, but anyway, it's, it's, it's hard to generalize about it. I do think it's a very personal, uh, it takes a lot of personal discernment to wrestle with those kind of questions, but I'm, I'm thankful that I still, uh, <clears throat> through the Wesley chair at Tyndale, which is, right. spons it's sponsored by four denominations. Right, right. Salvation Army is one of them. Salvation Army, Free Methodist, Wesleyans, and uh, Nazarenes. Right. So, so I still have a, an institutional connection to the Army. I've actually taught uh, three times at Booth University College. Right. You know, I'm teaching there again this summer. So I, I, I'm, I'm glad that I still have that chance to speak into the Army and to exercise that teaching role, sometimes in our, an Army context as well as other places. And, and still... I still want to see the army flourish and succeed Amen. and it's God's given, God given mission. Right. Yeah. And I first came in touch with you when you were doing a, you were commissioned by the Canadian territory to do a study on why young people were leaving the Salvation Army. Yes. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was on a part of a similar task force that was for the Southern territory. Um, so like you have analytical abilities, let's just say that. And that's very clear uh, in, in your writing and your ability to discern like complex information. So um, that's another, I shouldn't have got, gone there because I'm, I'm tempted to ask some questions about that. Uh, <laughs> give, give, me, give me just a, a thumbnail of, of what that study did help you with. Well, yeah, that was, uh, uh, it was trying to basically talk to young adults who had, who had left the Salvation Army and find out what had happened uh, what what was their story and we did some survey work yeah. as well with current and former salvationists and just trying to identify what were common concerns and um i mean the main the big picture theme that came out of that and this was like 12 years ago now but um yeah. was you know uh, authentic discipleships what people were you know basically looking for right mm -hmm. opportunities mm -hmm. for authentic discipleship um so, I mean, it, it's a perennial question that all denominations wrestle with. Right. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, I was doing that also during my doctoral work as a part-time job. So it was a good, was, it was quite an experience. Mm -hmm. And so people might be wondering about like, um, I'm, I'm doing a degree at the University of Manchester in England, the Nazarene Theological College. So I'm not actually studying with you at Tyndale, right. but it's, what's yes. interesting is that, um, um, you've been brought in to be a part of my committee because I'm working on William Booth's ecclesiology. And so it's, it's providential that that's been able to happen like this. They've been able yes. to assemble a team around mm -hmm. me. And so I was really delighted when that happened, but I, I wasn't, I was only familiar with a few short art, you know, um, journal articles you had written and I wasn't familiar with your dissertation. And, and, and it's helpful to hear this process that you went through and I can kind of trace like a, what I mean, I can see like how what you were learning and studying was impacting even this journey that you've been on. So I'm really curious. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to tell my audience the academic title, A Theology of Ecclesial Charisms, with special reference to the Paulus Fathers and the Salvation Army. But the, the easier title that came out in the published version is Division, Diversity and Unity. Right. So this is this is mm -hmm. really interesting to me. So people might already be wondering with the academic title, what do you mean by charism? What what are you talking about? Right. So as I was wrestling with these questions of sort of distinctives, right? Denominational right. distinctives, I stumbled on this idea of charism, which is I mean it's the the word is really just a transliteration of the Greek word for charisma which in the New Testament usually means spiritual gifts, right? That's right. the main place where it comes up, especially 1 Corinthians 12, 14, um, right. the spiritual gifts. So charism means a, a spiritual gift. And But what's interesting is in the Roman Catholic tradition, it's the main category they have come to use to talk about the different uh, religious orders and um, you know just movements within the Catholic Church. And I think a lot of Protestants don't necessarily realize or even stop to think about this, but... Roman Catholicism is a, is, a, is, a, is a big tent, and it includes a lot of renewal and reform movements within it. Uh, you know, the, obviously, we know the Jesuits and the, you know, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, and these big, big famous religious orders, but there's literally thousands of them, including lay movements, and then there's hospital movements and teachers, all sorts of different communities. I interact and, with them on a regular basis, right? Like all right. throughout society. Catholic mm -hmm. orders, and it, it, I, maybe if you're not familiar even with that designation, some folks in my audience, like that's these distinct groups or, or charisms that carry out a special function. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, 
the biggest hospital system in the uh, in our area is Baycare in the Tampa area, and that is run by the sisters of the Allegheny Valley, right? right. This really mm-hmm. distinct group. Well, there's only so many of them alive, but I, I'm connected to some of the executives of Baycare Hospital System, but everything still runs through these like five or six ladies that are still living, right? right. But this, yeah. this order, like, so like you, mm-hmm. we, our society, our world, and then you talk about Jesuits, I mean, Je- Jesuit schools all over the world. Mm-hmm. These are connected to orders sometimes of renewal movements within mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. Roman Catholic Church. So mm-hmm. just wanted to get like, and if I say something yeah. wrong, I'd love for you to say, that well, that. no, that's, that's right. And, and actually it would be beyond our needs here to get into it, but there's actually more technical de- distinctions between what's a religious order, what's a, a congregation, what's an apostolate, what's a lay movement. Right. The Catholics have these different categories. So not all these groups are officially religious orders. We often just say that, but we'll just say they're movements for, yeah. for simplicity's sake. Um, so they, after Vatican II, basically, from that point on and leading up to that, but especially coming out of Vatican II, became an of official sort of way of talking about these groups, that each of them was required as part of the the church reforms of Vatican II. So Vatican II is the 1960s, right. for those who don't know. Each group was required to identify their charism, their spiritual gift, which they okay. bring to the broader church family. And then they they were required to go under a period of sort of renew, renewal and uh, re- sort of reviewing their mandate, their mission, and if possible, restructuring or whatever, based on what their charism was. Okay. So I, I just found this idea fascinating, that, that this was a way to talk about distinctives that um, Drew had a biblical precedent and, and also had a, a unity kind of focus, uh, an interdependent kind of focus, as we all know, the idea of the, the, the gifts in the body, as Paul uh, writes about in 1 Corinthians 12, right? That's the classic place where the spiritual gifts are discussed. And so it, it provided this way, a different way than I was used to talking about denominational distinctions, yeah. which I hope would move beyond a kind of what I would call triumphalistic or over um, prideful kind of dis, um, focus on what makes us different. Right. 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 Because I think, so the, you know, we want to emphasize what's distinctive, but right. it can, it can become almost to a point where you're almost like, you're just justifying everything because you're different, um, you know, right. and your whole purpose is to be different. And, it, you know, it, there's there's problems there if it's if it's just going to perpetuate uh, division or or make you look down on other Christians or, or whatever. Right. Yeah. And, and we end up defining ourselves by what we're not than what we are. Um, that can become like a. a right. And if, yeah. And this isn't just something people might say, oh, yours come up come up with a veiled way to talk about the Salvation Army. But you're you're saying this is a part of, um, this is there's a, a longer tradition of these type of things happening within the church universal. Yeah. I mean, it's more to do with Protestant denominationalism and and the way, you know, we, we just become very comfortable with be all these divisions in the church. And um, so I was wrestling with that question as well. And um, and that's a that's a whole complicated set of issues, but um, we don't even think about it anymore. Even the word denomination, it's like, it's like brand, right? right, if, right. We're just, we're just like different brands of cereal in the cereal aisle. Um, where, whereas, you know, this is, this is God's church, right? And um, how do we recognize one another and, and try to, when possible, work together and um, affirm God at work in other groups and that's that sort of thing. So, yeah. I'm going to, So this idea of affirming what God's doing in other movements and like trying to find like how we're uni- united as this one holy apostolic church, but at the same time, like making room for the ways that we're different and how we distinguish ourselves. We, we are something, but we're not something. I mean, this is the, this is a real challenge. I mean, you're, you're trying to take a bite of a big apple here. Yeah, it, it is a huge, a huge topic. And so it, it in, in the end, um, I ended up focusing on one particular aspect of diversity because the the other way to look at the question, you, you can talk about unity of the church. Whenever you talk about the unity of the church, you have to talk about the diversity of the church at the same time. But right. what's the, what's the, 
the kind of limits of legitimate diversity in the church, right? Because we, it's silly to just say, "Oh yeah, one and diverse." There, there are limits, right? There's, there are boundaries. There, there are. Um, so what, what are the ways where it's appropriate to be different, and right. um, or where we can celebrate difference or diversity with, with also holding on to to unity? And another piece of this is. To, beyond just saying let's celebrate what God's doing in other parts of the church is that there's a commitment to truth as well as um, a de- diversity, right? So uh, one of the problems with the de- denominationalism is that you get a fixation on identity, right? And identity becomes more important than the the basic truth question. Wow! And so if I can put it in a in a nutshell, and uh, is Rather than I say for us as as Wesleyans, Wesleyan Christians, if, right. when we stop asking what's true and just ask what's Wesleyan, right? And, and Wesleyan equates to true, right? We've right, we've, right, right, we, right. We're we're just sort of <clears throat> we're 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 losing our way a bit. That we have to be more committed to the. We have to ha- keep that baseline commitment to to truth. Amen. And otherwise, and otherwise, how do we talk to other Christians even? Right? If if it's just well, what's Wesleyan? It's right because it's Wesleyan. Yeah, yeah. Then, then there's no point even having a conversation. Amen. So I, I, I remember like when I went to Asbury Theological Seminary, realizing that the way that there's critiques of the Salvation Army as Salvationists, that people were critical of the, in the almost exact same words about overemphasizing Wesley or the, the same problem. Like, I don't know about you, but growing up in the Salvation Army, probably you and I about the same age, I would guess. And um, like almost anybody with a beard felt like they were William Booth and William Booth, <laughs> no, like, like my life was surrounded. And here I am still at 40 years old, 41, I'm sorry, is it, uh, mm-hmm. still like writing and thinking about William Booth. But what right. the problem is I, I almost canonized him in, in like his words, right? Like, mm-hmm. so that people, it was almost like the same level as scripture at times. Right. Now I'm not saying that everybody does that and it wasn't explicit, but there is <clears> this <throat> sense like, well, our distinct distinction, our, Charism, eventually, we'll get to what you say that is in the, in, for the Salvation Army. That makes us, and we got to be, above anything else, we've got to be army. Or in, you know, free Methodism, mm-hmm. we've got to be free Methodists. And, you know, we right. are going to be connected to to our founders. We're, we have got to keep that. And I think it's probably a little <laughs> more dramatic in the Salvation Army. But yes. finding our identity there um, is really really public. So I love that emphasis on truth. I, I, I try to think of my own vocation this way is like, I'm committed to truth. Like that. I kind of like have a, I build it up. Like God created the world of nothing. Why is there something rather than nothing? I believe Jesus rose from the dead. I, I, I believe in the, the, the generally affirmed creeds of the church and keep on working. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a Protestant. And then mm-hmm. I think Wesley kind of expressed that in a unique way. And then I like the way the Salvation Army does. So I think the Salvation Army's mm-hmm. 11 Articles of Faith are a great expression of that. But by the time I go all the way back through all those things, you know, it mm-hmm. takes a long time to um, to describe that. So yes. I, I'm with you. Like, yeah. truth is more important. Well, another, another way to say it is, <clears throat> let's just say this. We're, we're Wesleyans because we believe the Wesleyan interpretation of the faith is true. Right. It's not the other way around, right? It's not that we're, we're Wesleyans because we're Wesleyans or something, or the truth is true because it's Wesleyan. It's it's that you know we we, we hold the we we take this view because we believe it's it's true, and and um, we we know it's probably not true. We we know it might be we might be wrong about some things. We we sure we probably are right. This is what Wesley says. Like everyone's yeah, wrong yeah. about everyone's wrong about some things. You, you have to be. No one's perfect. No one has absolute perfect understanding. But you don't know what things you're wrong about. Uh, so you hold your views and you hold them charitably, but you have the humility to recognize, you know, you obviously, uh, there's some issues on which, you know, Christians are going to disagree. And that's in that. Right. And that's where it gets hard. And, and I, I think oftentimes, like, it's not, it's, it's common for there to be the discussion of Salvation Army distinctives, right? Mm -hmm. And that language. I think what you're doing for us is helping in what your book and dissertation and writing is doing for us as a whole, and you're still serving the Salvation Army through this, is like it's moving us away from just thinking distinctives because that kind of like is Mm -hmm. this, what I'm I'm identifying with William Booth is this more than ecclesiology, Mm -hmm. like we're we're Mm -hmm. better than 
where mm-hmm. it gets triumphalistic, but you're helping us see like there's there's a tradition, a way for us to think about this through ecclesial charisms. So, right. so, so what can this tradition um, tell us? Well, it moves away from the the fixation on identity and sort of navel gazing mm. on what makes us special um, right. towards a calling. Because when we look at charism, here we go back to the biblical theology. Yes. Um, the charisms, the gifts of the spirit are always connected to a vocation. So you have the gift of, of, a, of, a, of a pastor that's connected to a role or a teacher or administrator, prophet. You know, you, there's a gift which, which is given in order, in, in order to equip you for service, right? So right, there's yes, a vocational yes. dimension. So that's helpful. It's sort of outward looking. It's sort of what, what does God want us to do? How does God want us to serve? Right, right through this unique gift that he has given us and the other thing it does is it, it pushes you to think about how you relate to others in the body right so on a on a personal level the gifts of the spirit that's that's and that's i make the argument in the in the dissertation that strictly speaking biblically speaking you know paul's not talking about groups of people mm, when he mm-hmm, talks about mm-hmm. spiritual gifts he's talking about individuals people within a local church right right but you can sort of extrapolate from that to talk about groups within the larger church body movements right. within the church so what how are our groups interdependent because that's the whole uh, analogy that paul plays out there that there's the eye cannot say to the hand i do not need you right like the parts of the body only function well together Mm-hmm. Um, and so there, it helps us to think about mission and vocation and have that outward focus and, but also, uh, to think about how we should, what we're contributing and what we can receive from other parts of the body. Right. 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 Mm-hmm. And that's something, uh, when, when weakness that can be for denominations as a whole is to not listen to other expressions of, uh, of like what other gifts are in other denominations, Mm-hmm. Of course, like you think of the Free Methodist Church, you know, that you're serving in now, like B.T. Roberts uh, comes in this time where there's similar things happening in the United States as happening in England. And like this emphasis even on freedom is something that's really key to Catherine Booth. And I, mm-hmm. I think it comes from the Methodist New Connection. Uh, but then mm-hmm. you end up but th- this the idea of freedom expresses itself in a unique way for the. A free Methodist church is dealing with slavery, right? And, and, mm-hmm. and rented pews, all these types of mm-hmm. things. So that could be something that is taken as a priority. Um, and when and in the Salvation Army side, I think what ends up happening is um, you, you can think like it's just the Army way. So we don't, uh, here's a good example. Like in the United States, like we are required to do a vacation Bible school, which is good. We, we should do that. Um, and there are some really excellent curriculums out there for vbs mm-hmm. group cokesbury life sure. all, all these sure. things and they do research they're they've tested them they have great videos but you know the army might say well we need to do our own vbs well we'll right. we'll, we'll, we'll we'll have somebody write our own v- vbs or we'll have our our own um youth program like our, there's a shop we can't we have to do it our way we have to do it right. and we end up making ourselves like maybe miss the blessing that can come from other expressions. of the And that's why I kind of hope through this podcast and through the ministry that I have like post officership is bringing other voices towards my audience that I think needs to hear from them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the armies may be a bit in a lot of other denominations are maybe a little further down this road, just by necessity, because right. most denominations are shrinking. Um, legacy denominations right older denominations um i mean it's right. it's different in the u.s and other parts in canada and europe it's it's further in that direction but um right most denominations I, every denomination used to have that kind of stuff right they used to have their own in-house yeah, sure. publishing and and very few do uh now and, and 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 that's just a financial reality but but it could push us to thinking, okay, well, do we really need to duplicate that? Um, right, or, right. Or how could we, how could we, how could we focus more on what God really wants us to do by drawing on the gifts of others in areas that they are really equipped to help us? Yeah. That would be a way to think about that. 
No, and I think part of how we get here is, uh, you know, Stanley Howard talks about the original sin of the Reformation uh, being solo scriptura, and that that leads us to, and I disagree with him on that altogether, but that leads us ultimately to have 38,000 denominations. Uh, I forget the guy who wrote the, um, maybe um, the unintended Reformation, Greg. Uh, um, the Brad Gregory. Yeah, Brad. Yeah. So, I mean, he, and he talks about this and how it affects all of society from you know, capitalism to all kinds of things, but, but ultimately that kind of, it's one of the black eyes on the, on Protestantism is that we, we break off and break off and we keep becoming more and more. Is, is that what you're trying to get to? Well, yes. I mean, and that's, that's why I went to this, why I was intrigued by the, the way Catholics think about this because mm-hmm. um, Catholicism has a way to incorporate renewal movements within its broader church structures right so they 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 make room for these movements of renewal or mission and then they have a way to sort of give them approval and incorporate them within the structures um but also give them a degree of freedom to to do what they're they're called to do and so and and people have made this observation like about john wesley you know if he'd been born in another country like if he was born in a catholic country he probably would have found a religious order yeah sure, right and so sure. people have made that sort of observation before and and there's a lot a lot of protestant movements not all but a lot of protestant denominations began as renewal or reform movements they didn't mm-hmm. intend to form new churches sometimes they do sometimes it's just they have a fight about a theological issue like no we need a new church right but right. but a lot of them it's unintentional and that's certainly the case with methodism certainly the case with the salvation army right they these were mission or renewal agencies and networks that sort of morph into denominations over time and so that that's part of the fascination with the catholic approach is to say well how is it different not that it's perfect there there's problems there too and but you know how have they been able to create do this differently than protestants um yeah right it's so interesting and i of course this is still a part of the salvation army's experience today in that there's a lot of resistance to thinking of ourselves even as a church Mm-hmm. Like, and and that in part comes to what I'm working on my dissertation, like William Booth's own language of saying those words, right? Yes. But at the same time, yeah. having like calling the people priests, to taking offerings, um, meeting on Sundays, uh, mm-hmm. having uh, uh, dedications, funerals, sacraments for the first yes. 13 years, all these type of things. Like, well, it looks uh, talks like a duck, look, <laughs> sounds like a duck. Right. Yeah. So in the case of the Salvation Army, um, what what's interesting, what's different is most renewal movements or mission movements, like they were really a revival organization at first, right? Revival Mission mm-hmm. East London. Um, most of them, their members would still be members of churches, right? So that right. You, they would be part of it, they would, or they'd be under a church, or if they're independent, their members would be members of churches where Salvationism seems to be from, from an early stage, they were just just involved with that mission and that was their function functionally was their quote unquote church home right even if it wasn't calling itself a church home and and was avoiding the the language and the practice of the church or renaming them and, and so forth and so on but but it was functioning that way and so that's that's unique and different so if you compare it to methodism for example right they would wesley refused to have their society meetings at, at a time when it would compete with the right. parish church because he wanted people to go to the parish church now they didn't always do that but that was sort of structurally he was trying to to encourage that to happen right right and william booth uh when the when they march on parades would ask the the bands not to play in front of churches on Sunday mornings. Right? Oh, interesting! Wow, I yeah. didn't know that. So, so there's this interesting, like, uh, oh, good. I need to I need to be, make sure I include that in my dissertation, right? So, but, <laughs> so here, like, the, 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 there is this definite still sense that it, and it, that there's a reverence for the Church of England as a whole. And I think one of the interesting things too is like if you look at 1878 when the name changes from the Christian Mission to the Salvation Army. I, uh, the 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 bill the poster that says that has a large quote by the Archbishop of Canterbury, mm. you know, and so there's still this connection, like right below it. I'm sorry, 
sorry, I don't have it in front of me to say what it is, but basically like right. saying the church needs to be doing things like the Salvation Army is doing. And, right. but it, it's almost like they needed that authority. They needed something that connected mm-hmm. them to this, even though mm-hmm. there's definitely explicit language that rejects that. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, so, and, and even in the earlier stages, right. The, there was a, I can't remember the terminology now. I know I looked at this, but there was a committee or something that boot right. advisory committee. So, yeah. so there was a kind of external or oversight and approval right. of things that were happening. And then eventually that the sort of broke off and be, became really an army right A- around right. that, around that time, I think around 1878, that sort of all came into place or f- was finalized. Um, but yeah, there were, there's a sense of uh, informally at least, right. Looking for affirmation and and getting it in some ways and not getting in other ways, but right. not but not a structural sort of connection. But that's the same with with Methodism, right? right? Exactly. Uh, Wesley, he, for all of his claims, uh, oh, I, I'm loyal to the Church of England. There was no structural connection between Methodism and the Church of England. It was just that Wesley was an Anglican priest, right? right. So, so the 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 army comes by these anomalies. Honestly, I guess you know. You right, know, right, right, right. It, it truly was the grand uh, the the child of John Wesley, and so on yeah. so many ways. When we think about ecclesiology specifically, mm-hmm. now you say that the uh, the charism of the Salvation army like what what is the sub mm-hmm. what is it that if we were to use these designations what is yeah. the army officers their gift it's difficult it was difficult to narrow it down and, and i ended up just saying evangelism among the neglected right okay. uh, that's how i identified it which i thought was now it depends how you identify evangelism okay and i was defining it broadly as you know including demonstration sort of of the gospel as well as proclamation so that that became a way to incorporate the social aspect but um yeah i'm sure salvationists might disagree or want to broaden it or or conceive of it a little differently but that was my best that was my best example and and part of the reason is because i was i was sort of following on the catholic literature and the way they do this um because they've the ones who thought about the most and they begin with the charism of the founder right so it, that's part of what roots it in the personal right, the biblical right. idea of the personal charism so it's sort of like there's a founder mm-hmm. and then the and they use that that term founder just like the salvation army does and then the movement sort of builds up around that charism of that founder so you know looking at william booth's story and his calling to be an evangelist among the neglected masses, as he would say, right? And then seeing this movement that builds up around him and those around him, that was sort of how I how I conceived that. And then, but it did become a question, could that change? What happened in 1890 with the right. social scheme and everything? Did the charism change? That was one of the things I was wrestling with. And I, and I ended up saying, no, it didn't change. It just sort of broadened their understanding of what it was they were doing, yeah. um, but but it didn't actually change. It's interesting, uh, evangelism of the neglected and William Booth's able to, uh, ability or desire to get in, to get to neglected. That's, of course, one of, oh, no, let me say, maybe I don't mean to assume everybody knows this, but like there's challenges to how well he did actually getting to the neglected uh, or mm-hmm. the, the people who were the intended audience of the East End. At the same time, there was like a whole other group neglected, and that was the Ministry of Women. And there's like other ways that he, there were neglected groups that found opportunity to serve within the Salvation Army. So I like I like that you use neglected rather than a term that can be shifted towards Marxism, like with, uh, mm-hmm. you know, as a marginalized or something like that. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, I think it reflects more their own language, right, That they and, and their own understanding that um, these are people that the church was neglecting. Right, 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 and so, or society as well, but but mainly they were trying to reach the unchurched masses. Was another phrase they would use, right? Right, so, right. So they're trying not to, and they would explicitly say, like, "We're not trying to compete with the church." That's a whole part of part of the reason why they they framed it that way, right? What, that they weren't a church because they were saying, "We're not trying to do what the churches are doing. We're trying to meet people and reach people who the churches aren't reaching." Right. right? Mm-hmm. So then, so you say that like the church as a whole has multiple charisms, like mm-hmm. that's the idea, but then groups, you know, in order to be a church and this, I think this is where it gets challenging, even in your own personal story, then mm-hmm. in order to be a church, you have to have multiple, but yes. then we step outside of that distinct 
carrot and there I'm using the word yeah. distinct again. Yeah. So, so what I end up saying is this, this whole scheme of talking about group charisms works best when you're talking about a sort of specialized movement in the church, a, a missional movement or a renewal movement, a, a group that's really trying to do one thing. And so, you know, and that's what the Salvation Army said, they're trying to evangelize the masses. And so um, you can think of it as this evangelistic group. And that's really focused on that one charism. Um, but um, in order to function as a church home, right, right, to do the things like teaching and raising children and, you know, membership and um, discipling and uh, uh, worship and all these things, you do need different charisms you know you, you can't just have a whole group of evangelists right you need right, someone right. who's going to then equip the people and and build them up and so so that's where the tension arises i guess between the movement and the the movement and church dimension or which salvations was so recognized right down to this day that are we supposed to just do this special thing of the salvation army or are we supposed to be like the church down the street and you know how does that get worked out right yeah, yeah. So um, in in practice, so I, there's sort of this theory of there's, you know, you have these unique charisms and each movement has its charism and it fits in the body. In actual practice, in actual history, it's more complicated than that because even 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 a Roman Catholic order too, right? They may have a specialized calling or whatever, and but they're in within their community they're going to need some diversity of of gifts in order to function and right. have their own sort of internal life but maybe we could say and maybe that's where the limits of this way of talking about it uh come uh come into play but maybe we could say you could still say there's one charism that um is especially characteristic of right okay of this group um, or, or, or you just make the analogy a little more loose and say, you, you don't, we're not going to try and create an exact analogy from the body and the parts in first Corinthians 12 to group charisms, but we're just going to say, look, diff God has used different groups in the church in different ways. And they have different gifts that could complement one another. And how can we, you know, use them to build up the, the church as a whole and, and yeah. work together. Yeah. Yeah. You say that one of the challenges that comes with this is this idea of, um, triumphalism that can be pronounced and it's not just in the salvation army but in in the other example you give with the paulist fathers but what's what is, it, what is that challenge well yeah triumphalism um I, I mean a sort of logic that god has used us therefore god's stamp of approval is on everything we do um wow. yeah right? thinking that um thinking god's on your side basically right presuming let's say presuming god's on your side uh, right and that's where again the distinctive kind of approach can be problematic because you sort of then you're looking back at your history and saying well god god has blessed us therefore everything we did must have been right 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 <laughs> right um and so and uh so you, you do need to be a little more circumspect and open to correction of the spirit, right? Open to right. Uh, identifying missteps and, and mistakes and affirming where, yeah, where God has, has led uh, your body, but also not presuming, and even in your discernment of, of what that might be, not presuming that you are God or that you have a direct line to know for sure exactly yeah. right, the answers to, to everything based on the fact that, so, I mean, obviously the Salvation Army was a incredibly dramatic um, history, right? An incredibly dramatic uh, revival movement grew at an astonishing pace. You can understand why people get right. caught, caught up in that and, and just in the elation of everything that's happening and the, and the, and the things all around the world. And, um, and so you can understand that, but over time you hope uh, a movement sort of, has a gains a bit more uh perspective and and can reflect a little more and um still celebrate but also you know as i said think think critically about uh, about things and in light of how god's working elsewhere and that's where maybe the charism thing helps because you know if if you take that logic to its extreme you end up saying like you're the only church or you, you're the church right. you're the group that has the best access to god or right. the, the, the ultimate revelation that other people don't have which obviously right. no one wants to really say that right 
so so just to to recognize again um the with a bit of humility that you know especially on theological questions and things like that like people have been debating them for thousands of years and um you you got to hold to your convictions but but hold them lightly especially on controversial issues right this is well this leads to a next question that i think is helpful because you identify to this this idea of triumphalism ends up leading to a place where you assume because even now even today now we're in 133 countries added a couple countries this year so Mm. because of that we must be right on this front so we need to keep going um at the same time like you end up thinking like the decisions that were made must have been correct, particularly this move in 1883 away from the traditional Protestant sacraments. Um, mm-hmm. The language can often be used to say, like, if, uh, I'm one who's very openly and published saying, like, the Salvation Army should reintroduce the sacraments. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, but the questions come to me, uh, did God change his mind, mm-hmm. right? So. Right. We were obviously right then, even exactly. though William Booth wasn't that clear, right? Yeah, <laughs> Perhaps yeah. we shall have more light at a future time, right? Uh, but even if that wasn't even what William Booth said, but we've developed this spirit, mm-hmm. this uh, attitude towards, and, and I think that the ecclesiological dimensions are expressed so clearly in the Salvation Army, in this, like, what exactly what you're saying. Mm-hmm. with sacraments and you identify and that's I, I was surprised by this when i got to this in your dissertation you identify sacraments as a false charism for the mm-hmm. salvation army talk to me yes. about that so yeah exactly i think um that's how it has come to be seen in the subsequent literature yes uh, in, like say from mid 20th century on and then uh, where, yeah, God led us to this. Therefore, this is our calling to tell the other churches they don't need sacraments. Or like, right. we are called to be a witness to the fact that sacraments are not necessary. Right, absolutely. That, the prophetic be- argument. The prophetic, prophetic argument, argument yeah. becomes part of this divine mission of the why is, part of the reason the Salvation Army exists. Right. Um, and it is predicated on this idea that, yeah, God led a, William Booth to that uh, decision. And therefore, it's it's right, and God wouldn't change His mind. But of course, that logic doesn't make a lot of sense because you're saying God led all the other Christians right. <laughs> wrong. I mean, yeah. it's 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 a very arrogant thing to say. Uh, yes, you know, it's the Salvationism would be what like a I don't know what percentage of Christians in the world it would be, but it's yeah. very very small. So yeah, yeah. so this is this is is a crazy thing to say. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll be blunt with you. It's, it, right? As a scholar, you're saying this yes. is crazy. <laughs> well, it's it's indefensible yeah. intellectually, right? It, it even just just look stepping back and looking at the bigger picture here of all the way that that the church has discerned the spirit's work, right? So, and I'm not saying that now. I, what I want to say about it is, you can you can try you can make a theological argument that sacraments are not necessary for salvation, right? And that's a debatable point that you can argue for. But you can't argue God led the Salvation Army to not have sacraments and he led other people like that. That is where are you going to find that in Scripture? The Salvation Army is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. So, (laughs) so, you know, it's you end up saying only the Salvationists and the Quakers, I guess, uh, you know, understand this. So so I think and and you're right about the early history. um, The Booth's decision being much more tentative and much more linked to. This idea that they were not a church, right. um, and and now to me the contradiction is once the Salvation Army officially declared it's a church, right? Then it, yeah, it's time to to revisit that question. And for me, and this connects my own personal journey. If we sure. go back Tell to that, you, yeah. because for me, I was encouraged by the direction the Salvation Army was going, sort of late '90s, early 2000s on this question, and right. just not changing its position per se, but just you know giving a better theological argument that said god could use sacraments why not uh you know why why couldn't god use these things but he can also right. use uniform wearing and he can use the altar call and the mercy seat and all these other things but then there was a shift uh and when shaw clifton became the general where you know really for sure that's where the the, the language changed and that's where i i became very alarmed with that way of thinking but but where it becomes a i call it a false charism because you're you're claiming this is our god-given mission to not have right right our mission is to not have sacraments 
which right. is yeah is is a, is a very strange uh way of this are, and it can be connected and in, in, here you are serving in, in a uh the wesley chair uh at Tyndale Seminary, you're in the Free Methodist Church. It's not like you've abandoned the theological foundations of the Salvation Army, right? But it mm -hmm. ends up being connected to holiness teaching, which mm -hmm. you and I, I think, would both affirm the way that right. that is expressed, right? But sure. uh, the, I, it's a scare tactic at times to say something like, if we drop this, then we'll also lose Mm. My life must be Christ broken bread. You know, this, uh, this idea that, right. that we have like, yeah. uh, and, and certainly, and Dave Reitmeyer has made this so clear and wonderfully clear that, that it wasn't the practical dimensions. It was the theological commitment to, that came via the holiness movement that led William Booth to move away from the sacraments, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, like the commitment to the holy life, like no doubt. Like I, I, I affirm that too, but that's, we wouldn't lose that by reintroducing the sacraments. Like you wouldn't, we wouldn't exactly. cease to be a holiness denomination. We would, and we wouldn't even cease to be distinct. Like I, I try to say like, uh, there's plenty that makes us distinct in the Salvation right. Army. Like we could list hundreds of things. I don't know, hundreds, dozens of things that make sure. us distinct beyond, yes. beyond what we do not do. Yes, exactly. And, and the whole, the, the, I think there's, there's been some interesting and, and helpful reflection on sacramentalism or sacramentality, right, from Salvationists about right. the sacramentality of service, for example, right, the sure. sacrament of the Good Samaritan. How can we be a sacrament in serving the poor? Those are really, but, but again, you know, taking the Lord's Supper does not dis detract from that at all, right? Amen. I, and even you can argue sacraments are not necessary for salvation it does not follow that you can't do them right it, that doesn't make sense either um so I, I think i hope that uh salvation will continue to discuss that and and um and and think through it in the in the years to come um but uh, but i think the point is if you make it a charism not even you don't use that language if you make it a divine calling there's no discussion to have right and right, that right. goes back to the truth versus identity question now you're no longer interested right, in the good. truth. You're just this is this is salvationism. Therefore, it's true. Right. This is what God told us, uh, William Booth. Therefore, it's true. Rather than going back to making the theological argument about sacraments and what sacraments are and are they necessary, where you can have a conversation with your fellow Christians and talk about what Scripture says. Right. If this is your divine calling, there's no conversation right? to have. Yeah, yeah. It, it, this is it, why it's like my, like my ultimate argument, and ultimate, my, like the, the best argument I think that can be made for the sacrament, reintroducing sacraments is our first article of faith. It's like, mm, this is about right. truth. Like, and I, I, and now some people would disagree with me. Some people look at it as a biblicist type of thing. And I, I even saw another scholar outside the Salvation Army characterize our first article of faith like that. But like, ultimately to me, it's about uh, revelation. Like, mm -hmm. uh, we believe the scriptures, the Old New Testament, were given by inspiration of God, and they only constitute the divine rule. Yes. Like, that's ultimately exactly. about revelation, and it's yes. about truth. Like, this is an epistemological claim at the start of our statements, and it's not like a, a biblicist view, like making the Bible into something. It's not. No, this is how we discern, discern reality. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, like, we're going to start there, yes. and that might lead us to do things that are inconsistent with the traditions that we've developed. Yes. And ultimately, I want to be committed to that primarily yes. ahead of anything else. And the other, and the other way of thinking the, the, that God led William Booth to do this is, is a contradiction of the art, first article. Right. Because it's saying there was a new revelation in 1883 <laughs> or in subsequent Salvation Army history. We have a new revelation now, and it's not to do sacraments. And that, again, so... Again, I think you can you can try to make the argument, but but if you if you turn into a special mission, you know you're you're closing that off and 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 adding extra biblical revelation right. and putting experience in ahead of truth. yes. And so yeah. like, that ends up being like a real epistemological problem for the Salvation Army is that we end up saying that our experience of the truth, and, and that's exactly what's happened to the Society of the Friends. I mean, this is mm. great. What's nuts to me is that like people will break uh, a real sophisticated word that what's nuts to me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what, what is a challenge to the way I process this information is mm -hmm. that I in like people will compare the Salvation Army and bring us in conversation with their friends. You know, like three years ago, I think at their annual conference, they voted, whatever their decision-making body is, they mm -hmm. voted 
to say you did not have to identify God as a personal being mm, mm-hmm. or, or as triune. Right. Yeah. How do they get there? Because mm-hmm. the doctrine of the inner light, right? Yes. Which is very yeah. close to yeah. the way salvationists talk about the sacraments. It's your experience. Like it's yeah. my experience yeah. of God that makes me distinct. Yeah, I think not many salvation have read much Quaker literature. It's very out there, right? It's very different. <laughs> it's a very, very different way of thinking. Now, there's different kinds of Quakers. So yeah, sure. There is some in Canada. You have more too, and there's two main camps that I don't know all the history, but there's one that's more philosophical oriented, more liberal. That would be the group you're talking about, I'm sure. And then there's another group that went more mainstream evangelical, and it might have even been through Holiness Movement. I'm not sure the history, oh, but because there were some Holiness Quakers, right? But there was, yes. I think, in the 19th century, there was a split. And so there's people like Richard Foster, right? Who's a, a Quaker today, sure. right? So, and George Fox Seminary. And so right, there right, are right. more churchly evangelical Quakers and, and then the more unorthodox Quakers. <laughs> but, but the point is, you're right. It's, it's that emphasis on the inner light, um, which is, can lead in dangerous directions. Right. It's a, a subjectivized way of understanding this. And, and I think like what this all ties back into this, mm-hmm. this big thesis that you have of trying to help us see like that these charisms are important, but they're not separate. They, sh- they shouldn't separate us from the whole entity. And I think that's the power of what you're saying that even goes against, helps us intellectually against like the Brad Gregory type of argument or even mm-hmm. like a, a Stanley Hauerwas sort of moment that mm-hmm. can really help us see, no, these are distinct gifts that, that can be done with the whole. I mean, it, I don't know if this is your goal, but I mean, that there would be a, a wider federation of churches. Mm-hmm. Is that what you'd like to see? Well, yeah, I don't know. that. That's, it's so complicated, right? And right. and there was a lot more enthusiasm for that kind of thing in the 20th century of of trying right. to merge churches, create, and, and there were denominations formed and some even interesting unions of different denominations, but, and then big ecumenical organizations. And they, they, they have their benefits and downfalls too, right? Um, sure. Yeah. But, and, and, but here's, here's the bigger point. Um, regardless of what it looks like, um, let's say, we should be, um, we should know our Christian neighbors better. We should be able to serve yes. together, we should be able to worship together. We should be able to partner, right? And and we should be able to, ideally, we should be able to recognize one another's ministries and all these things are are not happening or, or sometimes they are, but but could be happening more. And I don't know right. what it's like for you um, in, in Tampa, for example. Um, it, in some places, sure, the Salvation Army works really well with other denominations and use volunteers and things like that. And and that could that it could be on the on the micro level that could be what we're talking about, right? There's there's the big picture denominational bureaucracy level, but there's also the local, like in a, in a particular place. Yeah, sure, sure. How do Christians uh, serve together and build one another up and 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 by <clears throat> by not just making your contribution, but also relying on the gifts of others that enables you to focus more on your contribution. Right. So right, right. when you try to do everything yourself, you have to do everything. <laughs> yes. And then, and then that, you know, distracts you from your particular gift. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's a, honestly like, well, your dissertation leads me to say like, and this is the tension, like, cause I have somebody you know, serving right now as an area commander of Salvation Army, soon I'll be moving into the academy. Um, so it'd be a little bit different for the way that I function, but is like the tension of, well, should, should we be doing church <laughs> every now? I mean, that, that question comes into play or, and, and I want to, I mean, this is where I've been spiritually formed. That's where you James been spiritually formed. It's like, I've been discipled within the Salvation Army. It's my spiritual home. And I want that to be the case, but I think we can struggle. Um, and in part, I think just because of our ecclesiology, Mm -hmm. We can struggle to get those foundational pieces of what it means to be a church. So one of my tensions is like, how do we promote true congregational vitality? And I get, I get kickback for that in the Salvation Army because people don't like the word congregation or they don't like the word church, Mm -hmm. but I'm like, if we're going to do this, we need to really try to do it. And, um, or if we're not going to do that, if we're not going to be a healthy church, have healthy kind of systems in place to make us be a healthy church, then let's not be a church. I mean, right. I don't know if, sure. if that, yeah. it, it's like either or, I think. 
Yeah, I think I think that's that that, that makes sense, right? If you're going to be a church, be a church and embrace it <clears throat> while continuing to do your distinctive, offer your distinctive gifts. But if you can't do that well, then yeah, become more like an order. I mean, practically speaking, yeah. would that ever happen? Probably not. But right. But um, you, you sort of blue sky dreaming, right? Um, or or could you imagine? situation where say someone could be a salvationist but also but but attend a, another church on sunday morning right but be right. serving in a salvationist function somehow right, uh, right. In, in mission in a in a social agency or 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 some other way um could that be possible um i think it could be but i mean i don't again practically i, I think there'd be a lot of pushback but i think it could be possible though there are some interesting examples um the uh, I think Lindholm's work on is yeah. it uh, Sweden? The Lutheran Salvationist? The Lutheran. Yeah. yeah. So there, there was this something, and I haven't looked at that closely, but uh, I think it's, you know you had to be a member of the state right. church, so there was a, right, yeah. an allowance made, and I think something similar happened in Russia. Yes, I remember yes. seeing in Aiken's uh, book on the Salvation Army in Russia that there was salvationists are members of the Eastern Russian Orthodox church. Right. 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 <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So there, there have been some precedents for that, but uh, those are unique situations. But Well, and I'll do, I, we don't have time to talk about this, but it, the way this practically ex exhibits itself in my life is that there's nothing in m what I'm doing that would make me not function within my covenant as a, Sal a salvation Army officer within the document I signed the officer's mm -hmm. covenant. When I st start to serve at Wesley biblical seminary, mm -hmm. I will be fulfilling that covenant. I mean, now some people right. disagree with me. Um, there's no reason to think that I can't be functioning as a Salvation Army officer mm -hmm. in that position where I'm going to be training ministers, Salvationist officers to serve. So, so I, like, that's one way that practically expresses itself. Well, I'm going to yeah. have, I'll, let me let you respond to that. No, yeah, I think that that could be another area, right, of cooperation, uh, theological education. Um, right. And uh, <laughs> right where Why you, do we need distinct, why do we need 60 different, training schools and, and, and people functioning in those training schools who aren't generally qualified to teach. Right. Sure. So you could, you could, you could build a program on top of Asbury's program or something, sure. right? Where people do the or Wesley core biblical of, seminary or Wesley biblical seminary. They do the core of the, the Wesley biblical program. And then the army could do a few courses to add a distinctive flavor to that. Yeah, actually, we have a we have an MTS Salvation Army studies at Tyndale that's okay. offered in in conjunction with Booth. There's a promo for your uh, oh, there audience. you go. So so <laughs> this, they they do the core Tyndale MTS program uh, core right. core courses, but then you do six uh, specialized Salvation Army courses that are run by Booth College in in Winnipeg. But it's, awesome. it's a Tyndale degree, so that's one of the courses I'm teaching this summer actually on Salvation Army ecclesiology. So right up your alley. Yes. Maybe next time I'll ask them to have you teach it. Yeah. But uh, so that's an example, right? Where yeah, yeah. the Salvation Army in Canada wanted a pathway for a seminary degree, but they're like, we, we don't have the people to create a seminary program at Booth University College, but we could partner with Tyndale. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually the Pentecostal seminary has done the same thing. It's been going for 25 wow. years. Anyway. The, the, the challenge to that, okay, I'm gonna, I, can't, I can't leave it hanging. The challenge, the reason the Salvation Army in the United States isn't forced to do that is because we have the money. Yes. Sure. And so like, yeah. like other denominations are forced to do this. Like yeah. we, we, we yeah. won't be able to do it, but we can, we can make a way financially for this to happen. But, um, oh, James, we have so much to talk about. Okay. Sure. I would, you know, so the, I think the, this is a perfect example of the, the title of this podcast, More to the Story. It's not just good enough just to say, well, we're distinct. We do our own thing. Well, there's more to this. This comes in a greater tradition, a greater tradition of pursuing truth. So uh, I want to end with a question just for you, James. Like, is there more to the story of James Pedler that's not usually told? Is there more to the story of you that you'd like to tell? <laughs> I don't know. That's a that's a very uh, leading question. I'm not sure where you want me to go with that. I don't know. I'm just trying. Uh, I'm trying to do something clever, uh, and I might not work. Okay. Like, what's more? To, not, I'm not leading you. No, but no. what's something about okay. you that is often not told? Do you like you like to snorkel or you like to ice fish? <laughs> what is it? No, I would. I I love maps. I mean, they'll put that on the table. I'm a map okay. geek, so I, 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 I collect maps and atlases. And uh, I, I maybe someday I, that's a dream to incorporate that into my uh, academic work. Interesting. But, What's uh, your favorite piece that you have? The favorite. 
Oh yeah, I don't know. I I have um I have some interesting maps of like uh I have one on my wall here, Canada in seventeen. Well, what was then called uh, Nouvelle France. So okay, yeah, <laughs> you sure. know this is seventeen thirties. I think it is. It's an, uh, one of the early maps of the Great Lakes, and so you know I can see where 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 I am now, and uh, I like looking at these historical historical maps, especially. Oh. The yeah. Perfect answer. See, I'm, okay. I'm new with asking this question, but you'll be the, the first among many. Well, James, okay. thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your service to the church. You know, thank finding you. Uh, the way, you know, even despite the fact that it's a little maybe problematic to get there at times, mm-hmm. to be able to find that vocation and to serve the church. And I believe and I know you're serving the army well, too, in this way. And um, but ultimately serving Jesus. So thank you so much for your time. It's been thank great you. to have you on. Thank you for having me and God bless you in your ministry.